Now that's one perspective, but let's switch it up to another perspective. Again, we go to figure number and perimeter. So in this perspective, um, we're going to count it a little bit differently. And this one's really clever, I think. Um, so in figure 0, again, we have a perimeter of 6. In the next figure, figure 1, we can kind of visualize the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sides of that one hexagon is still sitting there. But it's like this side of the hexagon was shifted over once. Isn't that really awesome? Like, there's the hexagon, but with one piece moved over here. So the perimeter is 6 again, plus 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, if you see that, that thinking. Now watch how this reasoning works in the next figure, figure 2. In the next figure, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sides in that first hexagon, plus 1, 2, 3, 4, one group of 4, and two groups of 4. So it's 6 plus 4 plus 4. And then finally, in our third figure here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sides, that original hexagon in place, plus now three groups of four. I'm not going to count them all, but I think you see them. And in this way, we can predict the perimeter as well. So if we go to the nth figure, what would we have? Well, we always start with six, and then look, for the third figure, we had three fours. For the second figure, we had two fours, and for the first figure, we had one four. So we always add n fours, or four n. And that's the same formula we got before, just written in a different way. And this equals perimeter. Now let's look at this one last final way. And here's another way of looking at this problem. Only this time I'm going to write f and p for figure number and perimeter, because how many times can we write those words out? So for figure 0, again, the, the one hexagon we have has a perimeter of 6. Then for figure, the next figure in our sequence, excuse me, um, we have 6 plus 6, right, or two groups of 6. As if this time we take away the two sides that are hugging here, so minus right, one group of two. Then, for the next figure in our sequence, we have six plus six plus six, but here, let's just write three times six. It gets a little tiring to write those sixes out. So we have three groups of six, minus now two groups of two sides that are taken away, right, because each of those sides represent, each of those uh, lines here represent two sides connecting. So two groups of two. Then for the third figure, right, we have four groups of six, Right, four hexagons, each with six sides, minus one, two, three groups of two. Now this one's a little bit more complicated to put into a formula, but really it gives us some mental flexibility in dealing with uh, these kind of patterns. So for the nth shape, what's going to happen? So for figure three here, we have three plus one groups of six, or four groups of six. If in figure two we have two plus one groups of six, in figure one we have two sixes or or one plus one groups of six, and for figure zero, we have zero plus one groups of six. So for figure n, if you look at the pattern here, we would have n plus one groups of six. And then we take away n groups of two, and you can see that a little bit more directly. For the third, um, for figure three, we have three groups of two that we're taking away. For figure two, we have two groups of two we're taking away, and for figure one, we have one group of two we're taking away, and it works here as well for figure zero. Right, we have zero groups of two that we're taking away. So now we have this formula that predicts um, perimeter, and what's really awesome is that we can simplify it and see how it connects to the others. So here we have, we have we use a distributive property, six times n is six n plus six, right, minus two n. And if we simplify this, six n minus two n, that's four n plus six, which is the exact same formula we got before, um, for each of the cases, maybe written in a slightly different order, right? So instead of 4n plus 6, we can have 6 plus 4n, and that's the perimeter. So that's three different ways of looking at the problem, all different from mine. Um, my technique, I feel, is a little bit um, dry in comparison. Like, I love those techniques that they have. All I did was I kind of stepped back from the shapes themselves, and I, I, I saw that right away that this is a linear pattern. So at 0, at 6, then we're at 10, and 14, and 18, and so forth. So I said, oh, uh, the y-intercept, in other words, when the input is 0, the output is 6, so the y-intercept is 6, and then we add 4, right, for each step, or 4x, or 4n, or whatever, and that's our perimeter. 
In other words, I knew this is a linear function. I knew that the y-intercept is our starting point when the figure number is 0. And I knew that the slope was 4, the number that goes here. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of sad about my approach. It's just saying that b plus mx is y, which is the, the structure, the slope-intercept structure for a line. Um, and it seems so much less intuitive than the others, but it's exactly the way I thought about it. And that's OK, too. The point is, with a problem like this, you've got to think about it for yourself, and then you can discover all types of patterns. And even more so, when you're ready to listen to other people's strategies, uh, you'll discover something new. I did not think of all those little intricate ways that these shapes fit together. All right, thanks.